party up here. We're doing a little tango. Give Woo. us a second. Um, thanks for coming out, guys. Um, a reason we do these is to have filmmakers share their stories, their survival stories, and to encourage you guys to make your own work. Um, so to do that, let's have everyone introduce themselves. I'm Zachary Halley. I uh, directed and wrote it. And other stuff. I'm Derek Greger. I wrote the music. I'm Selda Sahin. I wrote the lyrics. I'm Steven Tyler O'Connor. I'm one of the producers, and I cast the film. And I'm Joe Russin, and I produced the film with these fine people. So with any film, any project, it takes um, a story and a script to get started, and obviously music with this one, and before you can do anything else. So kind of start there. How did the story come to be? How did the script come to be? Talk about how the music got written, all that good stuff. So. Well, so um, it, Zelda and I, had, we were writing... I work production, that's my day job, right? And it's totally soul crushing and, you know, you're, <laughs> I know but you, you know, everybody likes to pay their rent. And so we, I was in New York and we all three... We were guess, roommates. Yes, and technically yeah. Selden and I lived in the apartment, but Derek lived there too. <laughs> so uh, you have to have all these sharers in New York. And so we were working on something because I was like, I gotta be creative and it wasn't quite gelling and... So, and all this, and this was when Grindr was kind of huge and still underground and straight people didn't know about it and whatever. So Zelda was kind of going, this is amazing. It's like ordering shoes for gay sex. And so <laughs> how does this work? And, and so, so I, I, this is probably not good to admit, but Zelda used to grind for me. Like she would go, give me that thing. I'm going to do whatever. And it was I- was very good. Yeah, she, <laughs> she was very good and really cute boys. Like way, way better at it than I'm me. I'm picky. Yeah, and she, which, and they would show up, and we would, you know, and I would go off and pretend as though I had had the conversation. It was an improv exercise, whatever. So, so she says this would be a great musical, and I was like, this is be a terrible musical. What are you talking about? And we, and they, had, you guys had written songs together before, so we, so it was kind of like all in the air that everybody was collaborating, but we weren't, we didn't have a thing yet, so this kind of became the thing. Should we tell the Moscow story? Yeah. Is that yes, you should, I was gonna say you should yeah. bring up uh, so Russia. The only, so I used to be a performer, and the only bit of performing that I still do is I do this concert version of Wonderful Town, like in Europe or whatever. It's super, super fun, and, and I totally love it, but I, I was going to Moscow right as we, you know, and then it was like, we're gonna do this thing, we're gonna make this musical as soon as I get back. And so I went to Moscow and I was thinking I was very cosmopolitan and grinding in Cyrillic with Google Translate and whatever. <laughs> and uh, one of these, one of the, when we were in, one of the, there was some a boy that spoke English or grinded in English, probably doing the same thing except he was better at it than I was. And he said, you have to be careful because there's a serial killer that's been targeting men off of Grindr here. And he sends me, sends me this CNN article. And I literally like threw the phone down. I was so, like it sent a chill up the back of my spine. And so I was like, oh my God, that's what it has to be about. You know, of course, like even worse idea. Let's make it about Grindr and a serial killer and a musical because that always works. <laughs> so I came home and I was like, I want to pitch you guys this idea that it's really, really terrible, that, but I, th I think it could be awesome. I think it could be great. And to their credit, they're like super adventurous and thank God, like made it all work. You know what I mean? I think the, uh, now that you've seen it, I think arguably the reason it works is because the music is so strong, right? The songs are what kind of humanize it in a way. So it was, it was something that it shouldn't work and it only, in my opinion, it only works because, because they're singing and it's so artificial. Like it's so, it's like nothing about it should work and I don't know. It's done all right. Like it's <laughs> like people seem to like it. So I don't know. You guys should talk about like your, I, I was just going to ask the process of, of when writing the music and everything, is it based of ideas, treatments? Did you need to get a script to understand kind of where this thing was going? Kind of talk about that process of kind of working on music and getting it to script form. And kind There's of, a lot of wine involved. I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> we rented a house in Woodstock, and the three of us got in the car and drove from our place in Manhattan. And I think I just told Zach to play songs that, and I think you thought this was going to be, you were, you were worried that I was just going to go to like a traditional musical theater place. We all love pop music. I don't know if you knew that we could write it. 
Because, but, I mean, but that was good. So then, yeah. when we got to the house, I brought some equipment and stuff, and we started generating ideas. But we were listening to like Katy Perry and Kelly Clarkson in the car, and oh, uh, Call Me Maybe was like huge yeah, right was, then. Yeah. So, so when we got to the house, you know, we set up all the stuff and we started playing around. And I just kind of like I let Zach kind of steer it in that initial conversations, what we would listen to, and then we'd we'd go to dinner and we'd get back in the car and we just listen to all the things that you were trying to point us towards. And that's the music that Selda and I love to write. Well, and Selda, I want, let me not, I mean, so Derek is clearly a genius, but I need to give, like, Selda has this, as you can hear, you need to go back and, like, everybody should buy the soundtrack. The totally buy the soundtrack. But yeah, like, look at the, at the, the lyrics are so, <sighs> She, I'm pretty verbose. I like to, you know, talk in paragraphs. No. And then Selda is able to kind of take these like huge, complex ideas and then be like, Bleh. like here's this one like potent, so powerful. These lyrics that you're like, oh my god, how did you? I mean, she's a poet. She really is. Very sweet. I know. So basically, I want you to talk about being a poet. And then and then and Derek is able to go, oh yeah, I'm gonna do this thing, and then really kind of play around with it and go anywhere in the world that you want it to go musically. But now that I interrupt, I just wanted to say that thing because I think you're such a genius. So then I are starting, we're doing a lot of different types of music. We're doing some musical theater in New York and we're doing some country stuff in Nashville and we're doing a lot of pop music. But as we're exploring the, the form of, like I, I love the idea of, we can write kind of artsy songs that go on and have all different sections and that, that can be very fun. But I think writing a pop song that is super hooky, that gets to the chorus in like 30, 40 seconds, that has recognizable you know things that repeat, but still being not just phoning it in and actually having her able to express something that's clear, makes sense in such a, t a small amount of space is absolutely, Exhilarating, and I think that that's something that you're really so nervous now, starting guys. to know, right? <laughs> to become brilliant at because listen to some great pop songs, and then there's some stuff that's just horrendous, and it's like there. And also, she does it usually with perfect rhyme, and if she doesn't, it's like on like particular a choice that she doesn't. So um, I think that the pop music that we're doing at the moment is really like you're really shining as a lyricist. <laughs> that. But Am I supposed to like say things now? That's no, weird. No, no, no. So we can just yeah. let we can just let you keep, keep yeah. going. I love it. Um, the uh, well, I, we did go to these writing. I I can talk a lot, and I like to. I need to, as you know. Yeah, we. I mean, it's like, not like she doesn't. You know, I mean, we talk back and forth. They both right? can and talk I, yeah, a lot. And I'm I mean, usually like, the one who speaks the least. Yeah, Derek speaks the least, and he's like, "What? Just do it. What? Well, here's play, play, write something. Write the, that's not true. I'm just kidding. Um, the." Uh, <laughs> It's, I like to talk through ideas, and Derek is actually really good at talking through ideas with me, but it's, we work a little bit better when there's a third person. Like, he wants to listen and absorb it, and then, you know, he doesn't need words the way I necessarily do, but it informs what he does. So, Zach had sort of come up with a treatment with which we had talked about uh, for like the week leading up. Uh, he would go to work and he'd be like, what do you think of these ideas? And we'd go back and forth. So we went to this retreat. I don't know if we wrote them all on that trip. Did we? Two we did, two I think weekends. we did it. Yeah, two trips. Five songs. Um, we, so we went in knowing the scenarios, not necessarily what the songs, not necessarily what would happen, but what needed to be accomplished in those scenes. Um, and, well, and to be fair, Selda and I had been talking about just kind of general ideas about what was interesting about Grindr, what's interesting, like, I mean, for a year, yeah. you know, well, it, it kind of philosophically of like... Yeah, one of the things I thought was so interesting, because now there's a lot of apps for, for dating, it's not just Grindr, um, and what I think is so weird is, I'm, I'm not going to say my age, but I'm still relatively young, and I think that, like, the way we meet people now is crazy. Like, the, the people don't need to be that interesting anymore and like they don't need to be charming because you know information I mean even without online dating with Facebook and your friends of friends and Twitter and all this stuff you know so much about somebody before you ever meet them mm -hmm. and I think that there are, there are lots of benefits but I think that it's crazy that that's the case well and the funny thing is is and then from a storytelling perspective you know the exposition of a story is all done before you meet the person yeah. so I think that was what was kind of interesting is you don't need to, you, you, I mean, when I was in college, you used to tell your story, you'd have a first date, and I'm from here, and I'm from, I'm from there, and I like this, I don't like this, and now, 
you Google somebody or you look at their Facebook and you go, okay, well, I know all the things you like, so I don't even know. I mean, to be fair, I met my husband on Grindr, so, it, I mean, it works out sometimes. But, yeah, I haven't killed him yet either, so it's <laughs> fine. He's, he made it. He survived. So to loop this back around, then did the music inspire you to fill in the gaps with the script-wise, or did, how did that work? And I then feel um, like it all kind of happened like kind at of the same all time. Yeah, you have to on the trip too. Right. So like okay. we we it, it was a combination of all of those yeah. things. Yeah. Um, we knew where we kind of knew where we wanted to go story wise, mm -hmm. and we also made a decision very early on that we wanted all the songs to be able to be lifted out and be standalone pop songs. Okay. So that was. That was a choice that I think also was very, was hot then also to add something else to these guys of saying, oh, and by the way, you have to also do this so that they, they survive on their own. And I think they accomplished that. And the funny thing is then after it was all kind of done and then we were going out to our team, I think, our, I think it was David, our choreographer, he said, I can't imagine these songs anywhere but this script. You know, how could, you, how could the character say anything but what they're singing about? But you know, like my my dream was, I want the, I want the, I want somebody to have the song that the guy's, you know, singing as he's like strangling this poor guy. I want somebody to put that at their wedding or whatever because they think it's such a beautiful song. So, kind of maybe did that. Still, it's still a little dark. That's the one. No one thought we could make a great car. Exactly. But we did it anyway. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And so then, once you kind of script gets locked in. Talk about adding the other team members, the other producers, kind of how did you build the team out to obviously get the thing into pre-production and moving and going? And So Joe and I have known each other a long time, way longer than, I mean like two years when we graduated from high school. We had, <laughs> Joe and I had done a disastrous short film, sorry, production It was a learning disaster. experience. Yes, <laughs> disastrous short valuable. film, like right out of college. And it was like in the middle of like Western Pennsylvania and everybody's staying in their, you know, like, it was, it was very impeccably produced. It was one of those ones where we were still finding, you know, our, we were finding the story as we did it, and there was some, yes. we had some problems. Writing as you go, <laughs> which different. is always a good choice. And, um, and, really, and honestly, that's what kind of made me decide that we wanted to go into production, because I was like, if we're going to do this for real, we got to learn how the fuck it happens. Like, what do, what do real people do when they do this? It's, uh, and because I knew we were kind of doing that. Like, we were trying to... You were still in school, weren't you? Still at um, yeah, USC? Whenever, yeah, whenever we did. It was uh, like the, the summer in between. So he has a master's degree from, a, you know, big woo-woo. You should... I mean, you can talk about it. But I don't know. So, so he and I... And then Stephen and I had done another short film. So I, I don't know. I think that as you start to kind of go... And then, and by the time we got here, like I was working on White Collar and we were, you know, so you know, it's, we have to do it more than just the three of us. We're as not as a value uh, actors and people, um, the real thing is all of us were roommates at one point or another. Oh, yeah, that's I guess the real that's true. Story. You have to live with your team. That's Zach and how you I produced a movie before. You have to live with him. Steven sublet Zach's room. Steven and I lived together. Met Joe. Yeah, so. but, well, but I think what's important is, so you have this idea, you have the script, even if it's still, like, you do need a team. You have to have, like, you can't do all of this stuff and yourself. And a multi-talented team. I mean, you saw, like, you saw the credits, right? Like, the, it just kind of happened because of the way Post worked. Like, I typed in all of those credits. And I think every director should have to do that. So you can kind of go, my God, look at all these people that I don't even know. I don't even know who that guy is. And somebody, Joe or Steven or... Telly, who's not here, somebody got him to do this thing for either free. free or way cheaper than they should have done it, you know? And so you ha you, you've got to find a team of people that are either owed a lot of favors or have naked pictures of somebody or something, <laughs> like, so that they can, like, con all of these people into working on your dream with you, you know what I mean? It's something that I, I, I would, in my, in my right mind, I would never do it. If somebody asks me to do it, I'm always like, Nah, but at I the same know. time, you were always the last, the first one in, the last one out. You know, we were, we, we suffered because we wanted everybody to have this experience and feel a part of it too. And you were always very inclusive with everybody too. And the, the, also you can't get the songs out of your head. So one way or another, you're going to be yeah. thinking about this musical, whether you liked it or not. So that helped. Yeah. I think it's important not to be afraid to ask people for things. And if they say it's, no, yeah. they say no. And you have to maybe do it in a way that doesn't, burn bridges and make people be horrified of your phone calls, not be too pushy. But I think that, you know, and some of the other stuff that Selda and I are doing, it's just, we just ask. Just say, this is what we're doing. We're excited about it. If this, and a lot of times when people are, if there's not money, 
but they're they're kind of fancy and they're doing other stuff that may not be fulfilling them with their passion as much. So this can be like a passion project for them. But as long as the energy is good and the, you sh you seem appreciative and you seem excited, then you have something that's like something you can offer. Well, and, and I, I just want, the other thing too is we were all kind of genuinely able to like look somebody in the face and go, oh my God, thank you so much for doing this thing, whatever it is that you're doing. Like you can really, you, re you have to value what that person is doing, every single one, all the way down, up and down the chain. And I think that gives people the warm fuzzies and they, then they feel like they're a part of something. And they're yeah. a part, and this in particular, they're a part of something weird and strange that nobody else is gonna do and go, all right, I did this weird thing. It was this weird little musical that's online and you know. I think it's it. also both in production and in the realms of the cast. Um, I also worked uh, the casting for it, and nobody got paid. Like Anthony Rapp did that for free. Um, Claire Coffey did it for free. Pasha did it for and free, we, and, and we didn't even know her. Tell that story. We didn't even know her. So yeah, so we uh, Telly Leung is one of the other producers. He's on Broadway, and he's been on Glee. Um, and he knew Anthony, and so that was at least kind of like the friendly call of like, hey read this, do you think this is interesting, do you want to come do it for free? And he luckily was like, yeah, I do. Awesome. Um, and we auditioned for Pasha, that was the thing, we needed a really hot, young guy. Um, and in walked Pasha, and we were like, yes. Um, but then we had initially gone out um, to Megan Hilty for the role of Autumn, which I don't think we ever say her name in the movie, but like the girl um, who talks. Uh, so, we had gone out to her, but she had just booked Sean Saves the World and had already relocated to Los Angeles to shoot the project. And we were like, bummer. And her manager came back to us and said, hey, have you thought of Claire Coffey? And I worked in casting for NBC, so I knew that she was on Graham and knew she was a series regular. And I was like, well, is she even available? Would she even be interested? And her manager was like, get me an offer. So immediately, like, the mass email goes out to the team. I Guys, can put Claire the offer Coffey, on a cocktail napkin. Can I, put out, can, I put out the, can I put out the offer? Like, blah, blah, blah. It's the same as Megan's. And we did, and within a couple of hours, Claire had read the script, listened to the music samples that we had, and was like, yeah, I want to do it. And we were again, like, it's for no money. And she was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, I spoke to her afterwards, and she was like, I read it, and it was just so cool. And it was so interesting, and I wanted to do it. And she was like, and honestly, I don't need the $100 a day. I'm a serious regular on a fucking TV show. I don't need your $100 a day. Which is great, because we were like, good, because we don't have it. Um, <laughs> But it's, a, it's about asking people, hey, do you want to come do this thing? And we can't, pro like, you're not going to make a lot of money from it, but it's just really cool and it's interesting. And you're going to get people to say yes. I mean, we had so many little cameos of people. Matt Shingledecker, the guy that Pasha goes on the date with who um, wants him to eventually read a book, he's been on Broadway. Um, Trey Gerald, who's like the French guy when Anthony was speaking French, he's been Orange is the New Black and Deadbeat and... Um, younger, he's been in like all these shows and he's a friend of mine and he was in our other film that I work on with Zach, Welcome to New York. And I was like, hey, do you wanna come do this? Look, I know you're, you're so better than uh, you know, just doing this little cameo where you don't really have lines, but do you wanna come do this? And he's like, yeah, this seems like it'd be fun. So I think part of it is also you, you rely on your relationships both within casting and in production and saying, look, I may not be able to give you the money, but let's go do this, it'll be fun. And you know, when we go to make it a feature, uh, we'll bring you on and we'll be able to pay you then. So. Do you want to come along on this journey with us? New York isn't the cheapest town to shoot in. So talk what? a little, uh, what? I know, breaking news. Um, talk a little bit about that, because obviously New York is important to tell the story. It seemed like that was something you definitely was part of the story, but talk a little bit about raising enough money to make it happen, because you have to have a little bit of money. So talk a little about that, and how did New York influence that? You want to? Well, yeah. well, New York is actually, in some ways, easier than LA. Mm. Um, because True story. In, in order, like everybody always talks about guerrilla style filmmaking, but LA, everybody is very savvy to filmmaking process. If they see a camera, they know you need a permit and everything. In New York, you are allowed to shoot on the street. If you don't have sticks, you can be out on the street and, um, and shoot for free. You don't need to be permitted for that. Now, we did get permitted for that. The, sticks uh, are a for, tripod for, for those yes. you don't know. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Production. Um, <laughs> but um, one of the things, we did get permitted for like, uh, Central Park, although, you know, people we were kind totally of... Totally permitted. I have we were, a thing. I got a need. I had a permit in my hand. Like, you had to go through that process, so there were a lot of hoops to jump through, but the other thing was, it seemed like... L.A. sometimes, it's, in some ways, it's harder because people are very savvy. In New York, you would think they'd be savvier, but they are not. We weren't taking advantage of anything. We weren't damaging anything. We kind of had the rights to everything. 
<laughs> we stole a little Central Park, but, um, but yeah, so it, it was a challenge. The challenge was always with actually the crew and you know, trying to keep, because I, I think the most important thing is when people are volunteering their time, you know, and the actors and giving their time and you know, working for nothing or very little, you know, the low pay, um, what was really important to me was to keep them all protected, to keep them all comfortable and ha making it an experience they could enjoy. So that is really challenging in New York because there is nowhere to put people when you were out in the street. You know, I was sitting in vans and trucks and we had people running around all over the place. It was, uh, it was luckily I'm a Boy Scout so I knew how to camp. But um, that's pretty much what it was like. And I think to these guys' credit, to everybody's credit, I think to a person, every single crew member was like, this was a great time, I had a great time, you know, so even though we were in hell, and that's amazing, <laughs> it was, when you have a 22 hour day, right. where, you know, we're literally shooting from sun up to sundown to sun up again, and you have a costume designer with 800 bags of like wardrobe, and he has to get back to Brooklyn, and he's like, I had fun. Right. And you're like, oh, okay, good, now get in this cab. <laughs> like, it's, it's, there is something to be said about that, that, I think we kind of all understood and we all got was we get that we're not paying you, so we're going to make this as best of an experience it can be for you. And if it's, hey, run to Starbucks and I'll get you this coffee, or you really like Mountain Dew, um, I'll make sure there's Mountain Dew on set. Um, whatever it is, those little things that we did for our crew, I know it's not a lot, I know that doesn't pay your rent, but it makes this whole experience a little bit more worth it because we couldn't have done it without our amazing crew and our amazing cast um, who aren't here, unfortunately. but. It is, like, we were all very aware of, you're doing us this favor, so what can we do for you? Um, it is very symbiotic, and I don't think any of us ever had that standoff of, like, well, you work for us. Well, and I think, to, so, to, I guess, to take it back to, like, the, fu the fundraising part of it, right? Yeah. That it was kind of the same. We had a few big investors, we, we, you know, I mean, five-figure investors, and, uh, you know, then a, and you, it was the same thing. You kind of just ask. You know, everybody knows some rich people, and they, if they're going to believe in you, they're going to believe in you and go, all right, yeah, I can, I can spare this much money. And then we also did an Indiegogo campaign. Yes, we did. Which I personally loathe that whole process, but it, it is, I mean, it's super effective, and it's, the, it's kind of a formalized way for you to send it out to your friends and say, you, I know that you probably would buy me a drink sometime, but instead, will you give me $10 for this? thing and you want to get probably, like an album or an autographed script and yeah you know especially having somebody like Anthony on board for Kickstarter or it was it was an Indiegogo uh, they it's a way to kind of start building a grassroots support for your project which people may not people outside of your circle may not know about but then it's cool you know we also did a video it was I think the funniest video it was I think it was Derek Selda and I with Telly at the Ritz Lounge in New York uh, it was our like rap party, and we're like, Anthony, we have you. Like, let's go do this video thanking these people who gave us money because that is the one key that I'll give to anybody is your goal when finding incentives is to find high value incentives to give people that cost you no money. So for us, we found out that people really wanted Anthony Rap to thank them by name. So we did. We like had this list of names, and we made this video of like all of us kind of saying the name. And Telly, I believe, edited it. And it was kind of funny. We had a drag queen, the one who tries to take Pasha's shirt off, saying some of these people's names and can't pronounce them. And so he's kind of like making fun of them. But people loved it. They loved the fact that the cast is saying their name in a video. And it took us what ten minutes to do, and cost us nothing. So people really get involved in the process and like, oh, wow, I want Anthony Rapp. I love Rent. I want him to say my name. Or, you know, it's, it's a very time-consuming process, and it is kind of annoying, um, especially all those incentive fulfillments. But in the end, it starts to build that grassroots campaign. And if you can try and expand beyond your group and raise money that way, it can be a good way to do it, but it does take a lot of work. I, uh, and I think, it's, I think it's way harder to do it now than it was even... It's not what, new anymore. Yeah, well, even the three years ago that we were doing it, it was still kind of, I mean, now, you know, I get five Indiegogo requests a week or whatever, and you just, you're kind of going, oh, I can't do it. So I don't know what the next, I don't know what the next kind of step of that is, except that. Good old fashioned having good, right. good connections in your right. life. Yeah. But either, but either way, it is a good, you know, so find your rich friends, but then also like your, the, your other poor friends like us, you know, they'll still, if it's a direct connection, a direct ask, here's, go here, you know, from, on a, a text message, on an email, most people will give you five bucks, they'll give you $10, and 
that adds up. And our motto was uh, pennies make dollars and dollars make movies. So right. if you want to give us five cents, we'll take it because it's five cents we didn't have before. Right. Can you? Um, so we saw the final product. Can you give us a little behind the scenes, um, starting with rehearsals, production days, kind of how long did it take to shoot? Was it consecutive? How to kind of? I guess so. We had Anthony for we had Anthony for six days. And they were going to be consecutive six days. Yes, but then he got <laughs> another job in between, so we decided that we would break it up, which actually turned out fine because then there were... Gave us time to shoot all those, like, interstitials like, in between all the, and exactly. get all the separate so, things, yeah. You know, you kind of... I mean, boy, we conned our DP. Man. He, uh, we conned our DP into, you know, just kind of bringing that red camera with us for about 12 days. Twelve And, and to be fair... We put him up in a helicopter, and he did all those aerials, and he was, you know, I think he sold them footage. to Getty or yeah. something, you know. So you kind of try and find those things of he, he's a young guy that needs he needs stuff on his reel, and I this did, like never occurred to me until he said it, but he needs Anthony Rapp on his reel just as much as we do. That he nobody's going to look at his reel and think he's serious unless he's unless he's got some famous faces on it. So that's, that's the other part, too, is you have to find those incentives for the people that you really are going to take advantage of, of what do they want professionally. And our answer to that was our first AD knew what he was doing because he was a second second on white collar. You know what I mean? So, he w we, but, so now he's doing this thing where he's got another credit on his resume or whatever. So those are the people that you want to find. Don't look for a guy who's already a first AD on a network television show. He doesn't want to do it for you, but the second second does because he wants the credit. The costume designer was a wardrobe PA on white collar. So Joe and I worked on white collar when this was happening. That's why everybody White did. collar helped this movie Yeah, exactly. Lot. Yeah. They may not I mean, know it, but they did. No, but I mean, we literally, I, they I knew kid it. you not, like we begged, borrowed, and stealed, stole, stealed, stole, stolen, who cares? You're pretty. Whatever, I'm a writer for a living. I, so, uh, you know, you just, you have to, find, we did it on a hiatus. White collar had a, a one week hiatus. And we were like, we got to do it right then. And, you know, and the grip guy gave us a truckload of grip stuff. And the electrics snuck us some lights. And the studio let us park our truck there. Whether they knew, yeah, they didn't know that. But they, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. they did. No, oh, they, they did. did. I made, oh, right. I, I, know, I made friends guy. with all the security guards. So they yeah. knew me. And they were just letting and me And I was in. like, hey, we so, need these contracts printed up. And White Collar's production right, office the, was so glad to give us that paper. Thanks for the toner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, so That's you really... the limitations, like you, right? Yeah, right. But, that, but, but I think the other thing, too, is, like, we, I mean, we were super lucky that that, was, that that was kind of our day job at the time, so we had that support. But I think the point, really, is that you have to, like, you got to use what you got, right? Like, you've, you, whatever it is that you have some in, like, find a project that's, that's going to fit that thing. If you know some, you know, big, rich prick that has an amazing mansion, like, find a way to shoot in that mansion, you know what I mean? Like, do something... <laughs> So that you can don't yeah, call him a rich prick. That's probably good <laughs> advice too. One thing also that I think was interesting for us is, you know, a lot of the movie takes place outdoors, and of course, the one week where we were shooting was the one week where New York City was like, we're a seventy percent chance of rain every day. Um, so we constantly had to battle with when we shot outdoors for um, in Central Park. We shot under a bridge because it was raining. So we have the entire crew and everybody and all the actors just waiting under a bridge in Central Park. Um, we had to rearrange. Claire was so great, we were going to shoot her on one day, and then uh, we had to move inside because it was raining too hard. So we were like, Claire, can you shoot in an hour? And she's like, yeah, I'll be there. Like, we constantly had to juggle the rain as well with all of our outdoor shoots, um, which was also just like a production, not well, nightmare, but it was a, a hurdle. And also a tip, if you are setting, going to make a movie that is set primarily at night, don't shoot your night movie when the nights start shortest. at ten o'clock at night. night. Yeah, <laughs> every night. Shoot I mean, in the winter if you're yeah, gonna shoot at night. Literally the shortest, the shortest, like shortest nights of the whole year. Absolutely. That's when shortest. we decided to do it because you know, smart. Um, we're gonna wrap up. You guys have some great stories, but I want to kind of go down the line of um, advice for first-time director, writers, um, writers of music, producers. Um, What's that kind of one nugget of advice you're like, if you don't remember anything we talked about today, one thing to remember if you're making a short or making a feature. You should start down there because I can't. So. Oh, um, thank you, Zach. <laughs> um, I would say never lose sight of why you want to do it. Like be, you are going to, you know, you will miss so much sleep 
always forward, always forward. It's a marathon, it's not a sprint. You know, if you're getting two hours of sleep at night, know that you're gonna wrap someday. So just keep, and don't ever let that trickle down to other people. You're, everyone that is there is doing you a favor, so you get up, if you feel like you wanna die, have that smile on your face and be excited that you're making a movie today. And be grateful. Um, yeah. I guess my one thing is be super organized, um, have a plan. Um, one thing that I don't think we really touched on is there's a lot of also paperwork that went into it. This was a SAG after project. Uh, that meant there was SAG after paperwork that needed to be filled out, uh, exhibit Gs that needed to be filled out every day, contracts that needed to be signed. Um, deal memos that needed to be signed, like all of this stuff. And I would say, you know, just be organized or find a producer that is organized or find a person or an AD that is organized to do that all for you. It's not fun. It's not hard. It's just a little bit tedious, you know, but fill out all that paperwork in advance. Like the exhibit G's are so easy, but write everybody's name down in advance, write everybody's characters down in advance, you know, fill out the contracts as much as you can. And then that way, all you have to do is have people sign it. You know, this, we don't have the luxury of working on a big studio project where there's money and there's time and the actors get there and they're, they're in their dressing room and they have time to fill out the paperwork. It's usually like show up, okay, we're shooting in 30 minutes and then, oh wait, I forgot to have them sign the contract. No, on your first day, just get everybody to sign everything. You know, sign their contracts, make sure you're done with it. You need to be organized because the worst thing is, is getting done with your project and then realizing, oh wait, Claire, who's now in Portland um, shooting Grimm is like, oh, oh great, she's in Portland and she didn't sign her contract. Like you don't, you don't ever want to be in that position. Luckily we were never in that position because I'm OCD about paperwork. Um, As you can tell. But that's, I mean, it's, a, it's a big thing that I don't think a lot of people talk about. It's, it's not hard to do the paperwork, it's just tedious and you need to have somebody who, who does it. Uh, the worst thing is trying to do the paperwork after the fact and trying to track people down. It's easier, they're there in front of you, just have them sign their contract. Um, that would be my big piece of advice. We just had that conversation. We did. Mm -hmm. um, I Instead guess, preparing. yeah, I would say um, to, I think that you have to always think that anything is possible and that there isn't anyone or anything that's, like we, uh, you know, we got Anthony Rapp in the movie. There are bigger and, and, and more interesting and more whatever things that we could have done too. I think that people think that, oh, we don't have any money. Oh, we don't, we don't know the right people. I think almost anything is, is reachable. Everyone is sort of two degrees away from everyone. Um, and people say yes a lot more than you'd ever think they will. Um, and also I think surrounding yourself with people that make you want to be better at what you do is probably the most important thing. This is a general thought that I have about surviving in just the entertainment business as a whole. It applies to working on something like Grind. Um, it's a little cheesy, but I think it's actually really cool. Uh, it's uh, uh, an analogy that I heard about you can drive across the whole country with your headlights just shining 200 feet ahead of you. You don't have to be able to see the destination clearly to have enough perspective to keep moving forward. And I think that as someone who's doing music in this business, you kind of, you don't have to know where you're gonna go, you just have to know how to get a certain, a certain amount forward and make sure that you're doing that the right way. And I think that that takes a lot of pressure off of me as I try and navigate through this. And I've had some really awesome opportunities and a lot more I think are coming. So I, I mean, it's really I, cheesy. It's a horrible. Oh, it's, it's, that's it's awesome! Great. I loved it. I loved it. I think it's really good. It's, but I think it's so it's so relevant. I mean, that would I guess my you know kind of we were talking before about everybody now is everybody is a small business owner. There is no such thing as just an artist anymore. You can't you can't do it. There you have to you have to be doing this kind of thing. You have to have a podcast. You have to have a blog. You have to have these things that kind of put your material out there because they, it's, I don't know, everybody, everybody has to be multi-platform now. So I think whatever it is that you do, get your material out there. Get it, you know, if you're, if you're funny, do, just like make something funny. If you're serious, I don't, I don't know what the, you know, then make a short film that, that shows that. But I think that's the, you know, and get and then get a team, like get an awesome, awesome team of people that believe in you and believe in the project and it'll all work out eventually. Thank you. Let's give them a hand. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much. Thank you very much, guys.
Thanks all for coming out. Do fill out those surveys and give them the volunteer table. They'll be around to say hi. Um, and if you have any follow-up questions, thanks Come for coming to out us. this afternoon. Look at you guys for Rojo. Come say hi.